Hey, this is Ina, in with you in the fight back. This is kind of a follow-up video to uh, my thoughts on recent organizing. And it deals with a topic that I've jokingly uh, referred to as Jehovah's Leninism. That's right, Jehovah's Leninism. So get that into your head. Now, when I was with, out with comrades organizing, it was a very non-sectarian organizing. We were trying to do what we can to develop mass movements, mass struggle. Well, Jehovah's Leninism is kind of the opposite of that. This is about sectarianism. This is about that ever-present plague we see on the left. I don't care what country you're in, what time period you study of the left. You find this everywhere. You find it among anarchists, Maoists, Trotskyists, Stalinists, etc. And sectarianism is just an outright plague on the left. And the truth is that for me, one reason it took me so long to even become involved is because, at least in the U.S., most of the organizations that exist are heavily sectarian. So, when I say Jehovah's Witness, I'm obviously referring to, say, a Jehovah's Witness, or some kind of fundamentalist. And these people, of course, have the word. They have salvation, and all you have to do is accept it. But if you don't, you're damned. So, for Jehovah's Leninists, they are assuming that there is one pure, unadulterated, revolutionary theory tradition, which they are the heir to, and that this tradition holds all essential truths. And the way we can look at it is, it goes from Marx and Engels through Lenin to either Trotsky or Mao, or Stalin. Or anarchists would no doubt have the same thing. And anything that deviates from this one pure, unadulterated truth is a heresy. You're an unorthodox, and you must be cast out. So there's really not much room to actually learn, to develop, because in a sense, it's all been decided for you. So why actually bother to think about it? And there you are. And if you know me, I've said good things about Trotsky, Mao, even Stalin on occasion, and I've said good things about anarchists. You know, I'm pretty unorthodox on some questions. So, and that's the thing. It's like it shouldn't all be thought out before you, before beforehand. Marxism is not a dogma; it's a science. It's a method of thinking. And what else do we have? Again, those of you who don't hold the truth, you're not really so much to be won over as you're damned. You're the enemy. You know, they're treating contradictions among people as contradictions among the enemy. You're an antagonist. And, and they again, they expect agreement on all these questions of theory and history. It's not about coming together over actual practical questions of organizing. For instance, uh, should the un should, how should we develop this union? How should we develop this mass demonstration or this lecture series? It's about, you have to not only agree on those questions about how we're going to develop or come to an agreement on how do we develop the union, the lecture series, the demonstration, but how, but all the theoretical, historical stuff beforehand. And that's, you know, that's too much because people are going to have different opinions on this and it should be debated and heard out, but it shouldn't be a deciding thing on, a, on an organization. And... Another thing about these organizations is, let's say new questions come up. Well, you're, the leadership comes down with something, and you're expected to essentially agree beforehand, or you're expected to agree without question. If you Again, if you question, you're cast out. And different types of organizations will just throw people out, or they will uphold, because they have followed the correct and the pure, unadulterated Marxist tradition from Marx and Engels on to whomever, there's sometimes they'll actually have an appointed heir to that tradition within their organization. Uh, the, the classic example, at least in the U.S., is uh, the Revolutionary Communist Party's Bob Avakian, who's uh, seen as pretty much the next Mao Zedong, and it's really unwarranted. <laughs> He's at best, he might be a popularizer of Marxist concepts, but this whole, you know, that he is essentially going to bring about the revolution, and the organization has no real mass base, and it's, it's pretty much a little cult, a little sect, and uh, 
but because he follows that correct lineage, oh, he's the new savior. <sighs> nice religion, right? Um, but anyway, again, dissent in these type of organizations, it's not Leninist, even though I jokingly call them Jehovah's Leninist, it's ultra-centralist, ultra it, an ultra-dictatorship almost. And you disagree with the leader, you're disagreeing with the pure, unadulterated Marxist theory that goes back to 1848, and therefore you must be cast out, even if you're a good organizer or whatnot. And when these organizations get involved in mass movements, and they're actually developing, sometimes they can do good work, but a lot of times they're just there to convert people over to like every single point in their theoretical historical line as opposed to coming to agreement on broad questions and developing or raising awareness about communism, you're expected to agree, say, on Trotsky's interpretation of the rise of fascism in 1932. Really? I mean, I may agree with that, but I'm not going to expect other people to. Or you're expected to agree with Mikhail Bukhinin's analysis of the Paris Commune. Why? Why did, how does that exactly relate to this union work we're doing? These things should be hashed out and debated in broad consensus country through democratic discussion on questions. But I, I don't really think we should necessarily agree. And for instance, I believe that the rate of profit falls, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. There are Marxists who believe that there's a tendency of the rate of profit to rise. Am I going to not work with them because we do not share these same agreements on this? Or I don't I don't it's sectarianism. <laughs> At a point, it becomes irrational. That's why it uh, doesn't really produce revolutions. And again, something else is these. a lot of what these groups are is if, if they're not just in the mass movements trying to convert, they may be wrecking them. They may be just essentially trying to get everyone to convert to their leadership, and it'll just, draw pe it'll just drive people away, and the movement will essentially die, whatever that mo mass movement is. And in a sense, they tend to isolate themselves, you know? It's almost, again, it's like a cult, you know? You want to keep away from the outside world. It's impure. And again, keeping away from the outside world also brings us to the question of, you now, Maoists, and I believe Marxists in general say, truth is derived from practice, you know, from continual practice, learning from that practice. Well, for them, the truth is dogmatic. Again, it's this pure theory. And something about purity is you really can't let anything touch it. You can't let reality get to it. Because if reality gets to it, well, it's going to get corrupted. It's not, you know, it has to be kept pure. So, in a sense, this theory is untouched by practice. And a lot of these groups will just debate old questions. You know, debate for the one trillionth time something about the Soviet Union in the 20s. And, you know, we don't need that after a certain point. I'm not saying you shouldn't study it, but... For God's sakes, don't make it a deciding point in your organization. And and when these movements, these sectarian groups, look at other movements, other groups in other countries, whether it's Nepal or Venezuela, or any past movements as well, if this movement or organization or government does not live up to their dogma, because, you know, again, this pure, unadulterated dogma, if it doesn't live up to that, well, it's to be condemned. It's either revisionist, it's state capitalist, or whatnot. You know, there's really no sense of engagement. It's just, again, something to be kept away from, from you. And, you know, because you hold the truth, everyone else be damned. And again, a lot of these organizations would be inflexible organizationally. And they, and it, which with this top-down discipline, this iron discipline from members is really no two-way street, but there's no attempt to bridge the gap between leaders and led, and maybe only the leadership will be develop, be allowed to develop theoretically and intellectually, and the rank and file are sense just out there to pass out the newspaper. They're not there to actually, they're not encouraged to read. They may not read certain books that are outside the party canon. The truth is, you should read outside whatever your canon is. You should encourage you should develop all around because that's kind of what we're trying to do develop all around people with great uh, cultural and political awareness and I like to think I do that and I encourage you of course to read whatever Marxist anarchist and non-Marxist and even anti-communist literature you can you know
know, you should be able to defend yourself intellectually and politically. You should you should also be, you know, good at handing out and public speaking and whatnot, but you should um, be an all-around person, as it were. And some of these groups can descend into the, it would almost be like a cult, where you're, organ, where what you're told what to do like 24-7 hours a day. And it's, you know, that's, that's just wrong. We don't want that with religion. We don't want it with our politics. And something else these groups do, and uh, the Trotskyists are probably the worst at it, is they will split over shades of opinion and doctrine, again, because of this pure and adulterated theory. So any small disagreement, well, you got to split. The organization's got to split apart. And this, you know, and this is going to divide your forces. Instead of splitting over, say, broad questions that affect masses of people, you're splitting over these shades of opinion. To give an example of when a split would be actually a good idea is 1914. Socialist parties across Europe are supporting their governments in World War I. They're supporting imperialist war. Lenin says split. And Lenin's right, because that's a matter of principle. That's affecting, obviously, broad masses of people. You don't want to be caught with – you don't want to be working with people who are supporting imperialist governments. You want to actually be on the side of workers and peasants. On the other hand, if you're splitting because, again, someone disagrees on the rate of profit tends to rise or tends to fall as opposed to someone else, you know, that's not valid – that, in my mind, that's not valid grounds for splitting. That you should be splitting over broad questions that affect masses of people. Now, is there anything good to say about sectarians? Well, sometimes they actually do have committed organizers, maybe good speakers. And sometimes they may actually produce decent literature. And the truth is, it can actually convert people to socialism or communism. You'll read it and be like, hey, this makes sense. I'm a socialist or I'm a communist now. But these groups tend to reach a certain critical mass, however many hundred or thousand people it is, when, you know, they're not going to really, because they're so, they're following all these sectarian framework, they're not going to really broaden out and develop in a, um, a mass movement for communism, and that that's that's unfortunate. You know, sectarianism is should it's something that it almost keeps alive the, in a certain sense the Marxist socialist tradition when there's a real downturn in the class struggle. For instance, um, in the 1950s, a lot of groups were sectarian because mass movement was pretty much crushed on the left in the U.S. And you'll see that in other places. But when the mass movement's picking up, sectarianism you know, has got to be overcome. And if you look at sectarian groups that I, you know, that I've kind of referenced sometimes half jokingly, you don't want, you don't want to be that. You don't want to be part of that. And you want to try and develop these real broad-based Marxist-Leninist groups. Not, and that's what you should be working for. Or obviously a more open-minded anarchist, if that's your thing. But you've got to be willing to work with other people. You've got to be willing to win them over. This is the mass line approach, of course, but it, in a sense, can apply to all sorts of left-wing traditions. And I technically was never part of a sectarian group. I was just part of a revisionist um, organization, but which is, that has its own problems, and I've criticized that enough times. So this is kind of the other side of the coin those who are so divorced from theory that they're willing to just follow the reformers, the bourgeoisie, the democrats, or those on the other hand are so welded to this pure dogma that they're just cut off from any mass movement. So this is Ina saying that you should be looking at exactly how other movements have developed into mass movements. You know, the various communist parties in Europe, the Bolsheviks, the Chinese communists, uh, the anarchists in Spain, uh, the Cuban uh, Revolution, and we can go down the list here. So how should I end this? Well, don't be a Jehovah's Leninist, be a Marxist Leninist.